Okay. Uh, hi, kids. Uh, I'm going to try this out. Um, I've never used iMovie before, but what I think I'm going to try to do is splice together a variety of videos. So you might notice that the background changes, um, or maybe my t-shirt will change or whatever. Um, but I want to do my best to lecture you on some stuff that I normally do in class. And I normally do this uh, lecture with a whiteboard, but instead of the whiteboard, I'm going to use white papers. And I normally do this with a whole bunch of student volunteers. Um, it's generally a memorable lecture, but uh, today I'm going to have to use fake students. So I borrowed my boys' Legos. Um, I want to work on study goals uh, 34 and 35 today. Um, make sure that you have your notes ready. And at any time, you can uh, pause this, uh, rewind, fast forward, and make sure that you have your notes on paper. Um, anything that I don't explain well in the video, um, please uh, ask me um, the next time that we have a Zoom meeting. Um, which I think will be Wednesday if everything goes to plan. Um, okay, so uh, first, uh, you may already have this in uh, study goal number 34, but I want to talk about uh, ultraviolet light. So uh, there's the visible spectrum of light, and then at higher energy levels, there's ultraviolet. Um, that's not visible to our eye, but it's part of the um, radiation spectrum. Um, and it's uh, part of what we get from the sun. So the sun sends us visible light and a bunch of other types of radiation that we cannot see. Um, ultraviolet is something that you've probably heard of um, a lot. Um, it's just a really high energy light. Um, you could say that it moves too quickly for our eyes to pick it up. Um, that's probably an accurate way to describe ultraviolet. Um, and uh, there's three types, uh, UVA, UVB, and UVC. Just like visible light is broken into colors, uh, Roy G. Biv then once you get to the violet, uh, after violet, you get ultraviolet, and that's broken up into A, B, and C. Um, I have this table, so if you want, you can just pause it, either print a screenshot or write this down. Let's see if I can um, get this to you rather than put it on the whiteboard. Um, I hope that works, and if I have to, I'll reverse this. But you can see that there's uh, ultraviolet A, B, and C. Uh, you may want to print or pause or whatever. Um, I hope that's visible. Honestly, it looked pretty bad when I held it up. Um, I'll try it one more time. Gosh, my notepad is so nasty. Anyway, at least it's not backlit. Ultraviolet um, A, B, and C. Um, ultraviolet A has a uh, really long wavelength, which means it has really low energy. You can think of like a long wavelength as being really mellow. It's like um, Whereas ultraviolet C has a short wavelength, which takes a lot of energy to get across the screen. If I was using a really long wavelength, that would be low energy really 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 short wavelength would take a lot of work to get all the way across the screen so short wavelength high energy long wavelength low energy um, anyway ultraviolet a is like this long wavelength low energy ultraviolet c is short wavelength high energy and ultraviolet b is kind of in the middle um, uh, ultraviolet c is super 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 high energy and so it uh, breaks all bonds anything in the atmosphere um, will interact with ultraviolet C so none of it reaches the earth uh, we don't experience ultraviolet C because everything above us has used up its energy ultraviolet C 
comes out of the sun, super high energy, and as soon as it hits any chemical compound, it'll break that chemical compound, giving up some of its energy and become something lower energy. So UVC is energy. It's not visible radiation. And it hits chemical bonds and breaks those chemical bonds to become a lower energy radiation. Uh, ultraviolet C um, doesn't affect life because it doesn't usually reach life. Uh, ultraviolet C breaks all bonds, and so it uses up all of its energy way in the outer atmosphere. You might remember we talked about all those layers in the atmosphere. Ultraviolet C is all used up in the outer atmosphere so that the lower atmosphere sheltered, does not experience ultraviolet C. Um, ultraviolet B um, has um, pretty high energy. Uh, it would do more damage if it reached your skin, but it just so happens that um, ultraviolet B has a wavelength that perfectly matches the spacing of atoms in ozone, O3. So ultraviolet B is blocked by our atmosphere's ozone layer. The ozone layer keeps UVB from hitting the Earth. And UVA has that long wavelength. And so it doesn't have a ton of energy. It usually just kind of slides through the atmosphere. Um, it's rare that it'll find a chemical bond that's long enough uh, for it to disrupt. Um, ultraviolet A, um, does eventually mess things up when you have a huge concentration of atoms like uh, life um, ultraviolet a can cause harm to us um, so ultraviolet a usually sneaks through the atmosphere and ultraviolet a is the primary cause of skin cancer because it's the only ultraviolet that reaches us it's usually too lazy to interact with much of the atmosphere um, in study goal number 34, we had to talk about the three types of ultraviolet. They're A, B, and C, uh, low, medium, and high energy. Uh, reaches us, uh, almost reaches us except for the ozone layer for B, and would never reach us because everything else in the atmosphere blocks it for C. Um, okay, uh, I'm going to take a little break, um, and then we're going to come back to talk about study goal number 35. Okay, and now for study goal number 35, uh, we have to make and then break ozone. And um, to make and break ozone, um, I'm going to use some visuals that would normally have been students. And uh, before we get to that, I want to talk a little tiny bit about our atmosphere. There's three things I'd like you to note in study goal number 35 about our atmosphere. Um, first thing is that the atmosphere is uh, big and complicated. And historically, um, our atmosphere was relatively simple. Um, but, um, you know, as humans have been manipulating uh, the planet, uh, chemistries become a little bit more complex and more distracting in the atmosphere. Um, we have a bunch of new stuff up there. And so when I talk about the atmosphere, you may want to imagine how the atmosphere is in the absence of humans, relatively straightforward. And then given all the stuff that we've added to the atmosphere, um, how that's making changes um, to our atmosphere. Um, second thing I want you to remember is that there's oxygen all over the atmosphere. Um, because water moves up and down in the atmosphere, um, um, because water dissociates and gives off oxygen all over the atmosphere, um, pretty much any time that we do chemistry, we can just add in oxygen. Sorry, my dog is chasing our chickens. Charlie? Thanks, Toby. Sorry, um, maybe I'll edit that out, I don't know. Um, so second, 
uh, there's oxygen uh, pretty much everywhere in the atmosphere. You'll notice in the next 20 minutes when I'm talking, oxygen's just going to pop up like, oh, where'd this oxygen come from? And because we're in the atmosphere, it's pretty safe to say that there's oxygen everywhere. It's like in the room of a high school student finding dirty laundry or whatever. I don't know, whatever sleazy things you have in your room. Um, the third thing I'd like to add is Hofbrinkle. And if you uh, understand chemistry, you'll know what I'm talking about. And if you don't, get ready to pause. Hofbrinkle. Hofbrinkle is hydrogen, oxygen, fluorine, bromine, iodine, nitrogen, and chlorine. These are called diatomic gases, which means when you see these elements, you'll always see them in twos because they're diatomic. Like hydrogen is H2 and oxygen is O2 and fluorine is O2 and bromine is Br2, I2N2Cl2. If you ever had one single atom, you would write it with an asterisk because the Hofbrinkles are diatomic, which means they like to be in a buddy system. You'll never see them solo. You always see them in a partnership of two. Bit complicated atmosphere, especially because of us. Oxygen's all over the place, and some elements like to be bonded. Um, usually, if I had high school kids for this lecture, I would um, call them up now, and uh, we would use them as a visual. But since I don't have high school kids, I'm forced to use Lego men. So see, they're in a little buddy system. There's two of them. See how they're kind of holding hands, sort of? They're in a team of two. You would not find in our atmosphere single hydrogen, single oxygen, single bromine, single fluorine, iodine, nitrogen, chlorine. The Hofbrinkle elements are never by themselves. They just freak out and they find something and they jump onto it. They can't be alone. Maybe you know somebody like that. Maybe you are somebody like that. That just can't be alone. Those are the diatomic elements. They are elements on the periodic table which cannot be alone. They have to be in a buddy system, like kindergartners on a field trip. They cannot be solos because they just they just can't take it. They just can't be lonely. So we've got Hofbrinkle. Now, oxygen is a Hofbrinkle element. It is the O in Hofbrinkle. Oxygen cannot be alone. It needs to be in a buddy system. So, when it's dissolved in water, you could say that that's dissolved oxygen. Or when it's up in the air, it's oxygen gas. And then here's some more oxygen gas. Everybody's happy. But high up in the atmosphere, kind of above the ozone layer, right at the very outer edges of our atmosphere, we have this really strong type of radiation. I mentioned it about eight minutes ago. It's called ultraviolet C, really strong radiation. Ultraviolet C is strong enough that it can break this bond. So oxygen gas, O2, can be split into single oxygens, and they're gonna freak out and get lonely, and they can't be lonely for very long, so they will immediately come back together as oxygen gas again. Here they are, happy oxygen gas, everybody's happy. See? They say, yay, yay, we're in a team of two. If I had high school kids, I'd make them raise their hand and go, yay, we're in a team of two. Happy team of two oxygen. Yay. 
then they get hit by ultraviolet C and they can't be alone for very long, so they will clump back together. And pretty much any time that you see oxygen in our atmosphere, it'll be ultraviolet, sorry, it'll be O2. Oxygen's always gonna be two of them. If ultraviolet C splits them, that's like a millionth of a second before they find somebody to clump onto. But something wacky happens in our atmosphere, and this is where things start to get interesting. Sometimes in our atmosphere, when ultraviolet C splits oxygen gas, you've got these two singles, and instead of finding each other, there might be something else that's closer, like another two oxygens, and if that's closer, they make what's called ozone, which is O1, 2, 3. The third oxygen could not be alone. It was too sad and scared and clingy and desperate. And so it went, ooh. And formed this threesome of oxygen. That's ozone. We've made ozone. Um, get ready to pause. Let me see if I can find the right paper on my virtual whiteboard. Uh, oxygen is split by ultraviolet C into two singles. And those would usually form back into oxygen gas, but sometimes one of these, either one of them, will be closer to oxygen gas, and instead of being two singles that come back together, one of those singles might find oxygen gas and make what's called ozone. Ozone is naturally occurring in our atmosphere. Um, ozone is made by sunlight and oxygen gas. Ozone is being made all the time. So the hole in the ozone layer heals itself because where ozone is being lost due to human activity, the ozone depletion problem you heard about at the beginning of this unit, ozone depletion, is naturally reversed when um, ozone is made by plain old everyday atmospheric chemistry. Um, it's always being made. There's always some oxygen that gets split and rolls up on another oxygen to make a threesome that we call ozone. So we have now made ozone, and I'll be back in a minute. Okay, now things are gonna get really weird. Um, now, uh, we're gonna break ozone. And um, I wanna remind you that our atmosphere is organized in layers. The really lazy gases all come to the bottom because gravity can grab them because they're lazy gases. And the really active gases go all the way up to the top because they're really active and so gravity cannot grab them. In the middle of those layers, there's a whole layer of like moderately active gases. Those are ozone. Or rather, that's where the ozone is. There's a lot of ozone up there. So now we're in that layer. Here comes some ozone, three oxygens. And here comes another ozone, three oxygens. And if I had high school kids, I would make them stand in the front of the class holding hands in sets of three, like this. We're in the ozone layer. Here's O3, O3, O3. Another O3. You can see I rated my kids Lego stuff. So these are uh, ozones. They are oxygen one, two, three, one, two, three. Okay, three oxygens. Ozone layer. We're in the ozone layer. Um, this is generally a stable compound. Um, Ozone is really critical to life. We talked about this before. It's toxic down here. We don't want to breathe ozone. Ozone in the troposphere where we live is dangerous. But ozone in the stratosphere up above us is beneficial because the shape of ozone perfectly matches the wavelength of ozone B. 
and so ozone is good, it's sunblock. It keeps ultraviolet B from reaching us because uh, ozone stops ultraviolet B. Okay, now you might remember about 15 minutes ago, I told you that uh, humans changed the atmosphere. What used to be a pretty boring layer of the atmosphere has new stuff up there. <sighs> stuff that we've added. These represent modern chemistry, little stuff and big stuff, totally new to the atmosphere. Um, stuff that uh, humanity has added to the atmosphere that was not there before. There's a lot of new stuff in the atmosphere. A lot of it's irrelevant. All of your random colognes and a bunch of volatile organic compounds that come from our emissions. There's all sorts of new stuff up there. But there's a category of stuff, get ready to pause. Um, called ozone depleting substances, ODS. These are compounds that we make, they're man made, and these man made chemical compounds are notable because they spit off a single Hofbrinkel atom. So um, there are natural ones. These are called free radicals. This does happen in nature. But humans have added ozone-depleting substances like chlorofluorocarbons, halons, hydrochlorofluorocarbons, uh, carbon tetrachloride, and methyl bromide. And what's special about these all of them release a bromine single or a chlorine single, just a single atom. Um, that's a big whoop. Uh, having new stuff in our ozone layer that might spit off a single of one of these, not a diatomic pair of them, but a single. Single hydrogens are not a big deal. Single fluorines are pretty rare. Single iodines are pretty rare. Single chlorines and single oxygens are kind of irrelevant. But single bromine and single chlorines, those are a big whoop. I'll explain. Here's the problem. An ozone depleting substance is called an ozone depleting substance because it might break off in the presence of ultraviolet C. One of these, this is a chlorine atom. It's an atom, a single. And uh, those singles don't like to be alone. Remember, chlorine doesn't like to be alone. Likes to be in uh, pairs of two. This single chlorine gas does not want to be on its own. This single chlorine atom wants to be in a buddy system. So he's freaking out. He's like, dude, 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 somebody, I can't be alone. I can't be alone. I can't be alone. This guy can't be alone. Can't be alone. So at the first possible opportunity, this chlorine needs to make a bond. And in the ozone layer, there's candidates. Because when this guy comes around, these guys, they're in a threesome. That's not really, they're diatomic gases. They like to be in a pair of two. And three, maybe you know, doesn't really work out. A lot of work. So these three, they're not really digging this group of three. There's like a preference for bonding where like any of them would be happy to kick off one of them because then the remaining bond would be stronger. So when this single chlorine comes around, 
this oxygen leaves because this guy needs the oxygen more than they needed a third. Now they're happy. They're like, dude, we get to focus on each other. This is working right. And these guys are like, well, yeah, I guess, you know, we can do this, I suppose. So what used to be chlorine and O3 has become chlorine oxygen, CLO, and O2. This is perfectly stable, happy oxygen gas. Drift, drift off into the atmosphere. But there's a funny thing about CLO. Um, there's really no better way to explain this. Um, both of these guys are racist. Chlorine doesn't really like oxygen as much as it likes chlorine, and oxygen certainly doesn't like chlorine as much as oxygen would rather find a single oxygen. So this CLO will stay distracting the chlorine until another oxygen comes by, and if there's a solo oxygen up in the atmosphere, and you know, oxygen split by ultraviolet C in the upper atmosphere makes the singles. And so there's singles around for very brief periods of time. As soon as a single sees this guy, boom, they're really happy now. They're oxygen gas. That's O2. They're stoked. But this guy's like, oh, no, no, no. I can't be desperately alone anymore. This is so hard for me. So boop, the chlorine is going to peel off and oxygen from the next available ozone. And remember, we're in the ozone layer here. So we've made happy oxygen gas. This is a happy twosome that they're gonna be stoked. And these guys, they're kind of okay. At least they're not alone, but they're racist. So oxygen comes around and boop, takes away its buddy. O2, happy, stable, long-term. Chlorine is like, oh God, I can't be alone. I can't be alone. And so, as soon as O3 comes around, boop, more ozone is destroyed. This is so absurd. More ozone is destroyed, resulting in oxygen gas, which is perfectly stable. And this temporary brief allegiance between chlorine and oxygen that is better than being alone, but fundamentally doesn't feel right. That oxygen needs to find another oxygen atom to make oxygen gas. And that chlorine keeps looking for something else. If there's more ozone, the entire ozone layer could be destroyed by this one single chlorine because it's going to keep peeling off the third oxygen from all the ozones, and then it's going to keep losing that oxygen buddy to other oxygens that come around. The only thing that could end this is if chlorine finds a second solo chlorine, then they're like, oh, Cl2, and now they're happy. Here it comes in chemistry terms, get ready to pause. Chlorofluorocarbons are ozone depleting substances because in the presence of ultraviolet, they peel off one of these singles. And then that single, when it's around oxygen, or when it's around ozone, will make a CLO relationship and a happy oxygen. But that CLO, that O is not really stoked on this. They're racist. So CLO is going to split when there's radical oxygens around. That makes the oxygen gas, but that leaves this guy alone to keep doing this over and over and over and over again. Uh, it used to be a really simple atmosphere. We've made it more complicated. It has layers, and there's ultraviolet up there. Uh, ultraviolet C is a really big whoop. Ultraviolet C can break all bonds. So in the outer atmosphere, oxygen gas makes these radical single oxygens that can't be single for very long. And so those single oxygens uh, will find oxygen gas to make ozone. Um, that ozone is pretty stable, you know, 
those guys can't be alone, so they're just kind of stuck in a group of three. Um, but we've added these new ingredients to the atmosphere, these big complicated compounds, all sorts of them. There's a bunch. These are big chemical compounds. If you diagram this, there's like all sorts of pieces. And what makes them special is that ozone depleting substances have these loosely attached Hofbrinkel elements like a single chlorine. That single chlorine could eat any volume of ozone. If this uh, house was full of ozone, one chlorine atom would split up a single ozone, lose its oxygen, split up another ozone, lose its oxygen, split up another ozone until it ran out of ozone. It didn't take very long for a small number of man-made gases to completely diminish an abundant gas in our atmosphere. That's the ozone hole. We lost ozone to these compounds that split off single Hofbrinkel elements that just ate their way through the ozone. And the only thing that can possibly stop this is if the chlorines can find a permanent home, another chlorine. Um, that's not very likely. So we believe that the destructive life of one chlorine atom is about 11 years, um, during which they break up um, ozones um, a few times per second uh, nonstop. So you can imagine uh, one of these can remove something like billions of these by peeling off that third oxygen who's, you know, at least they're not single, but this isn't very strong. And so this guy's going to go someplace else soon, and this one's going to just keep working. I know that was crazy, and with students, it's equally crazy, but at least it's memorable. With Legos, it's just wacky. Uh, hopefully, you can ask me about this later.